All right. Hello, everyone. It looks like uh, Simon's already sharing his screen preemptively because it looks like Gavin's a few minutes late. But um, very, I hope you've all been enjoying the conference so far. Today, we're going to have a one hour career session where the idea is uh, to get some very experienced academics who have experience both in academia and with interacting with the private sector to give some insights into what the job market is like, how to prepare yourself for a career in this, in this field, whatever insights they feel that they'd like to share to help guide you better in, uh, in uh, getting a career in, uh, in the quantum technology sector. So we're going to have uh, Gavin first, but it looks like he's not here, so we'll get Simon first. Uh, Simon's actually a colleague at uh, University of Technology, Sydney. He's a senior lecturer. Uh, in uh, the Centre for Quantum Software and Information. And uh, he also runs a consultancy, HBAR, which uh, gives him a lot of exposure to how the private sector works. And uh, he's very, very experienced in this. So I'll hand over to Simon. Uh, thank you very much. And we'll have some questions at the end. Thanks, Peter. Um, so I have prepared some slides. Uh, I, if I'm correct, um, you wanted me to speak for about 25 minutes, um, so hopefully I'll keep to time, but please feel free to uh, interrupt me um, at any point. And I'm going to talk uh, a little bit today to sort of give you a bit of an overview of what's happening globally. Um, I'm sure Gavin will talk a little bit more succinctly about uh, pathways to career opportunities in the quantum technology space. Um, but what I would like to do is sort of emphasize exactly how fast this space is moving, uh, who's doing what and where, um, and basically drill into you the idea that if, if you follow a sort of a career path in quantum technologies and quantum information development, uh, right now there's a, a plethora of opportunities for you. There, there really is uh, a lot of jobs uh, on offer around the world with a lot of companies in a lot of different areas of quantum technology. And provided that you go through the right educational programs and actually get a bit of training in quantum information and quantum technology, uh, right now uh, there really is quite a lot of opportunities uh, for, for jobs uh, all around the world. So I'm sure this is all very familiar to you now. Um, as to the sort of definitions of quantum technologies or, or sort of what we're talking about in this sort of next generation of, of quantum information and, and science development <clears throat> and the distinction between uh, sort of the second generation of quantum technologies, which we're all working on today versus say the first generation of quantum technologies, which really define the 20th century. Um, so I'm sure you're aware of three quint quintessential quantum technologies that define the 20th century, uh, namely the transistor, uh, lasers and uh, nuclear magnetic resonance imaging or MRI machines for medical imaging. Um, and I think it's, it's very unarguable to say that these three technologies really did define the information technology revolution of the 20th century. And they're all focused upon exploiting the quantum mechanical properties of what we call bulk quantum systems. So these are the, the quantum mechanical behaviors of trillions and trillions of particles of light or trillions and trillions of atoms, um, depending on whether you're talking about laser systems, optic fiber communications or transistors. Whereas in this new class of technology that we're all working on, second generation quantum technologies, we're looking at more direct exploitation of quantum mechanics, uh, specifically manipulating or benefiting from the direct control of the quantum mechanical wave function of the system, whether that's a, a photon, whether that's a, a superconducting, uh, ring or whether that happens to be an atom. And I'm sure you're all aware, aware of the, the plethora of technologies that people look at, whether it's computing, uh, communications and key distribution, uh, quantum imaging, metrology, uh, and quantum simulation. Now, over the years, there were quite a lot of sort of distinct areas of quantum technologies that are sort of starting to boil down now into sort of three or four core pillars. So this is a, a picture from uh, the Quantum Manifesto, which was sort of the prelude document or the pre-document from the European Union that sort of initiated uh, the EU flagship in quantum technologies development. And they defined four pillars uh, of innovation for the second generation of quantum technologies, namely communications, uh, simulation, sensors, and computers. And depending on who you talk to, simulators and computers sort of come under the same banner. Uh, so there may really now be three pillars, namely computing, sensing, and communications. Uh, that are a focus of worldwide investment, worldwide research, 
And now uh, a lot of uh, companies are starting to get involved and getting involved in a, in a very, very serious way. So to give a bit of a flavor of what's happening at the moment, so these are two graphs. On the left-hand side, uh, you see corporate investment or an estimate of corporate investment coming from pre-established tech companies around the world uh, who have now decided to have a quantum technology division, whether it's in communications, computing or sensing. On the left-hand side, uh, you see the startup space, some of the major players or the, the most heavily funded players uh, in the quantum startup space. Uh, again, focusing around hardware development, mostly of quantum computing, um, but also some companies that are focused on so quantum software or quantum algorithm development. So in both of these sectors, we're starting to see ever increasing amounts of money being poured in. So now, depending on how you count it, you're looking at at least $2.5 billion US that have been invested by the venture capital sector uh, around the world into quantum computing hardware and software startups. Uh, we now have multiple companies that have gone public uh, already, uh, which I'll talk about a little bit. And we're now starting to see companies that are raising ever increasing amounts of money. Um, so this is no longer getting into, you know, half a million dollars or a million dollars of investment. Some of these companies are now raising close to half a billion dollars uh, in private sector venture capital investment uh, for building quantum computing systems. On the corporate side, it's a little bit harder to estimate because they don't make these figures public. Uh, so you have to do the best job you can in sort of understanding who's investing how much into what. And certainly the Chinese companies and the Americans are putting in the vast amount of money. So all the major tech startups in the United States, IBM, Google, uh, Amazon, Microsoft, Intel, they all have dedicated research programs, both in quantum software and quantum hardware, and they're all hiring heavily at the moment. Uh, last time I checked, I think Amazon uh, has about 53 job applications uh, currently open uh, for quantum technology uh, development based in either Seattle or Los Angeles. Um, I think they're the biggest at the moment in terms of people who are currently hiring, but Google's hiring, Microsoft hire, is hiring, IBM's still hiring. Um, and then you also have Chinese corporates uh, who are also heavily invested into this space, namely uh, Alibaba, uh, Baidu, Tencent and Huawei. Um, they've all got now dedicated quantum research programs. Uh, they're hiring heavily, obviously domestically um, within uh, the Chinese population, the Chinese students who are now graduating from a, an uh, ever-increasing uh, university investment or government investment that the Chinese government is now putting into quantum. Uh, and all of these corporates are now expanding heavily uh, into this space. And to sort of give you a feeling of, of how quickly this has happened, this is sort of a rough diagram of quantum computing companies or, or companies that were involved in the actual development of hardware or software in quantum computing. Um, that says pre-2017, it should be about pre-2015. Um, not 2017. And there was a spattering of them, mostly coming from the defense sector in the United States. So mostly military contractors were the largest companies in the private sector who were looking at uh, development of quantum technology. So that includes places like Lockheed Martin, HRL, Raytheon, Northrop Grumman. Um, and then there are a couple of little startups, um, mostly looking at quantum communications. So Quintessence here in Australia and ID Quantique in Switzerland are the two most notable examples. Uh, in the startup space that were very, very young, and D-Wave, who was founded in 1997, um, easily the earliest uh, quantum technology company or quantum technology startup that was founded. But now it's exploded. And this list is only partial. Last time I checked, um, we're looking at approximately 150 startups that have been founded in the last three to five years. Um, across quantum computing, uh, quantum communications and sensing, both on the hardware and software side. And we also have pretty much all the major corporates now getting into the game. Um, any technology corporate uh, in the world uh, that has a large amount of uh, market capitalization is now uh, looking at quantum in a, in a serious way and actually has research teams uh, developing hardware uh, or software for quantum computing. And we're starting to see these sort of ecosystems sort of evolve. Um, you might have seen some of them, uh, the quantum uh, community at Microsoft, the IBM Q network, uh, some of the stuff coming out of uh, startups such as Rigetti, um, but also 
these quantum computing challenges coming out of big corporates that are not actually building quantum computers, but they're interested in what quantum computers can do for them. Um, so the one on the top left-hand corner is a good example. This was a, a couple of years ago where Airbus uh, looked at crowdsourcing quantum algorithm development uh, with respect to aeronautical engineering. Um, a lot of the companies are doing this kind of thing. So Airbus has done one, BMW is currently doing one to figure out uh, how quantum algorithms can help with the automotive industry. Uh, Zeiss, who's a, a lens manufacturer, an optics company, uh, did one a little while ago. Merck, a pharmaceutical company, has done it in the past. And a lot of this is because these companies don't really know what to do with quantum yet. They're interested, they're willing to put a little bit of money into it, um, but they either don't have any one you know, within the company who understands quantum, uh, or they might have one or two people, and they're trying to figure out exactly uh, what this technology is going to do for their business in the next 10, 20, 30 years. Uh, this is changing. Um, these companies are now hiring dedicated quantum people to start up internal research divisions uh, inside these big corporates. And I expect this to continue into the future with pretty much all major companies that have some investment in a plethora of sectors, whether it's the technology sector, the pharmaceutical sector, finance, insurance, stuff like that. But also let's not uh, kid ourselves about this. While the private sector investment is extremely large, it is still dwarfed by government investment around the world. So government investment is still uh, the major source of cash when it comes to research and development around the world. Um, a rough estimate of at least announcements that have been made in the last 10 to 12 months uh, puts the level of government investment on the order of 25 to $30 billion US that has been announced from various governments around the world just in the past four years. So this still dwarfs the public sector investment in terms of startups and, and companies um, where government initiatives and, and dedicated government sponsored programs around the world are still putting a lot of money into the development of quantum technology. And to give you a sort of feeling for this, this was a, a, a survey done by McKinsey back in uh, 2015, looking at the amount of money that was spent around the world um, at that time, around 2015. So the numbers here are in millions of euros. So you can see here the European Union collectively was spending about 550 million euros in quantum development. The world total was about 1.5 billion at the time. And some of the, country, some of the countries that uh, have expanded rapidly in the last five years, back in 2015, wasn't spending much. So China, for example, um, was only estimated to be spending about 220 million euros uh, onto quantum technologies. Japan, about 63. Since then, the situation has changed significantly. This is more of the picture that now exists. Uh, China is dominating uh, the investment uh, into quantum technologies, followed uh, not so closely um, by the United States and the European Union, but both the United States and the EU are now ramping up uh, in terms of their investment into quantum. And then you have sort of smaller countries who have put in a, a comparatively good amount of quantum, but are being dwarfed now by China, the US and the EU. So here are some numbers. Um, so on the left hand side, we're looking at government investment, how it's changed from 2015 to 2020. Now, keep in mind the x axis of that plot is logarithmic. It's not linear. I really should probably turn it into a linear plot to make it much clearer as to the differential. So China has announced uh, approximately 13 billion uh, dollars worth of funding, Australian dollars worth of funding uh, in the previous five years. Uh, the Germans and the French have announced 3 billion uh, each, respectively, as part of sort of COVID recovery programs. The United States is about 2.6 billion. Uh, the EU as a whole, 1.5. Uh, India has announced 1.3 billion uh, Australian dollars into a national initiative. And then countries such as Russia, the UK, even the Netherlands, uh, have put in quite a large amount of money. Uh, and certainly it has accelerated significantly in the last five years. And from a talent perspective, from a career perspective, at the end of the day, you know, they're spending a lot of money, but we need people to do the jobs. Um, there is a huge amount of money coming into this sector, but we still have to train up people. We still have to pe have people that are fluent in quantum or at least can work with quantum technologies 
to fill all these places in these research programs. So on the left hand side, we look at the government side. On the right hand side, we look at the, pub, uh, the startup funding sector. So the top group of uh, companies are all hardware companies and the bottom group of companies are all software. We now have three startups, three quantum computing hardware startups that are valued over a billion dollars. This is Cy Quantum in California uh, that are now valued at uh, 4 billion Australian. Uh, INQ just went public on the New York Stock Exchange uh, a week and a half ago. They're now valued at 1.5 billion. Uh, Rigetti, another California based superconducting company, uh, they've just announced that they're going to go public uh, in the next couple of months and they're looking at a valuation of, of 1.5 billion as well. And then you have companies such as Xanadu in Canada. Um, that have raised at least 200 million, IQM is a superconducting company in Finland, Silicon Quantum in Australia, and then you have hardware, uh, software companies that have also raised uh, funding up to you know, nearly $100 million, specifically Zapata in Boston and Cambridge Quantum Computing, uh, obviously from the UK. They're now merging uh, with a, a company called Honeywell in the US, which is a defense company doing iron trap technologies. And again, all these people are advertising. Every one of these companies is advertising for positions heavily at the moment uh, across a range of different things, whether it's hardware, software, device fabrication, manufacturing, software engineering. All of these companies have uh, quite a lot of jobs on the table at the moment. And these companies are all sort of getting into the same business. They're all sort of talking you know, cloud-based services, integrating quantum into uh, the classical infrastructure that exists around the world. So we see AWS, Amazon's already integrating uh, quantum hardware into their uh, cloud services. Specifically, they're integrating hardware from Rigetti, uh, INQ and D-Wave. Um, companies such as uh, Xanadu are putting their own systems on the cloud at the moment. Uh, Google, we expect to be putting their systems on the cloud soon. Uh, IBM has a huge network um, of quite a lot of actual quantum computers uh, sitting on the cloud at the moment for people to uh, access through their IBM Q network. And most of these other companies will probably um, move in the same direction. Uh, quantum computing is anticipated to be a cloud-based system um, at least for the next decade or decade and a half. And so the race is on now is to slowly expand these systems, put more of these systems on the cloud and make them big enough that they're actually going to be useful um, for other companies to utilize instead of classical hardware technology that might come through AWS or um, Microsoft Azure or Google Cloud. We then have a plethora of software companies. Now, most of these companies are trying to figure out what to do with these systems what kind of algorithms can actually be implemented on these uh, quantum computers as they grow. Now, a lot of these companies contract and work with uh, these what we call non-quantum corporates. So a non-quantum corporate is a large corporation who is interested in quantum technologies, but who is not building them themselves. So you might think some, uh, someone like BMW, you might think of Boeing or Airbus. They're not building their own technology, but they want to use it at some point. So a lot of these companies do uh, sponsored research and then partnership deals with those companies to try and figure out how do we use quantum computers for aeronautics or how do we use quantum computers for chemistry or pharmaceuticals. Uh, some of these other companies, they look at developing tools um, to design quantum computers, to optimize quantum computers uh, or to program quantum computers. Uh, some of these companies focus on that. Um, but because we're, we're so young, uh, as a field, everything's still sort of settling a little bit. We're still trying to figure out exactly what we can do. And a lot of these companies are still trying to figure out what's going to be a profitable business model for them moving forward. You have another class of quantum software companies that very much want to develop tool sets and, and, and software that's actually going to be used within the machines themselves. Um, so these are six companies that sort of focus on, on that kind of aspect of it. Um, for example, three companies, Quantum Benchmark, Labber Quantum and Q Control, they look at what they call the quantum firmware level. So this is about the classical software that you need to build control electronics um, to you know, do high fidelity or highly accurate uh, single qubit gates or two qubit gates on a, on a particular hardware technology. 
Uh, and in fact, two of them have already been acquired by a big defense contractor in the United States. So Quantum Benchmark and Labba were both uh, bought by Keysight Technologies, which is a US defense contractor uh, this year. So Q Control in Sydney is pretty much the only one that's left uh, that's very much dedicated in this space. And then you've got companies such as Phasecraft in the UK, HQS in Germany and Horizon in Singapore that are smaller scale software companies that are very niche in what they're looking at. So HQS uh, looks at algorithms specifically for material science and quantum simulation. And Horizon in Singapore is looking at building sort of translation tools where you could imagine sending uh, quantum algorithm calls in Mathematica or MATLAB sort of as an inbuilt sort of functionality to these sort of tools. So these companies are very interesting as well. So I'm only going to flash this side up, slide up very quickly. This was a, a reproduction of a slide that was given at a, at a conference in 2019 by the Boston Consulting Group. You see a lot of these things as to sort of estimates of market value uh, as quantum computers scale over the next 20 years. Um, these things are very, very optimistic. I sort of take these with a bit of a grain of salt. You know, is the market going to be worth $55 billion? This is just for chemistry and, and catalytic simulation. Is these, you know, market evaluations and how much the sector is going to be worth over the next 20 years accurate? Who knows? Um, they're largely guesses. But again, we need people. If this is ever going to happen, um, even in the most optimistic scenario, we need very, very good people to sort of fill the places in all of these companies that are being funded. Um, there is a talent shortage right now. So I won't go over this too much into the to the actual types of quantum technologies that exist. I'm sure you've all heard of them. Um, we have multiple different systems that we're looking at for quantum computing development uh, that I sort of lump into different generations, depending on how advanced they are and ultimately how fast they're gonna be, how fast, uh, small they're going to be and what kinds of infrastructure that they're looking at. But everyone's looking at uh, developing different types of systems and everything's still very, very young. So we don't know what's ultimately gonna be the best way of doing quantum computing. And to give you an example of this, this is a, a plot showing how many physical qubits we've had over the years uh, since 1998 up until this year. So we've gone from sort of the reliable construction of a single qubit back in the late 90s to now places like IBM and Google being able to uh, develop chipsets containing on the order of 50 to 100 qubits. So just very finally for the last minute, minute and a half I've got left, I've only spoken really about quantum computing and quantum software. Um, there is still two other major pillars of quantum technology that has companies that have corporates that are looking at these kind of things. Um, that includes quantum communications and quantum sensing. So quantum communications is also a vast uh, area of research and a vast area of technological development. This is not, um, as large in the private sector space. Um, there are companies that are looking at quantum communications, mostly uh, quantum key distribution and stuff related to quantum uh, security. Um, but there's certainly nowhere near as many companies in this space as there is for quantum computing. Uh, so here's some that exist, as I said, Quintessence in Australia, uh, Magic in Boston, ID Quantique in Switzerland, uh, and a couple of Chinese companies that have come up. But again, most of the money that's coming into quantum communications is coming from governments. And in fact, this is the major push of most of China's investment at the moment is in the national security sector and developing a backbone quantum network uh, to develop their encryption capabilities that are at least in principle are, are unhackable because of uh, the nature of quantum mechanics. So they're putting up satellites, they're building fiber optic networks, uh, they're looking at drone integration they're really doing quite an, uh, an impressive job at sort of covering the country and all kinds of uh, quantum enabled networks to at least do key distribution. So that's a, that's a very interesting thing to look at. Um, again, whether or not communications companies end up being quite as prolific as they are for computation and, and quantum software, um, I'm sure it'll happen, whether it happens in the next five years or the next 10 years, um, it's anyone's guess at this point. Uh, and I'll leave it at that. So thank you all for giving me the opportunity to speak. Thanks very much, Simon. Um, there are a few questions in the chat group. Could I, if anybody has any additional questions, maybe just type them in and then uh, 
Simon can read them out uh, directly, if you wouldn't mind, Simon. Uh, so do them now? Yeah, if we just go through those uh, now, rather than hand the yeah. video around. Uh, so so uh, one question is, I'm oh, sorry. No, go for it. You can read as well as I can. Uh, so one question is, how imperative do you think is funding for research in quantum computing for countries like Pakistan, given the tech race first world countries like China and others you mentioned have gotten into? Do you think the potential militarization of quantum computing hinder the third world countries' access to it? Um, it is a concern. Um, at the moment, we haven't explicitly run into issues about uh, first world countries sort of clamping down from a security perspective in developing this technology. Um, but it will happen. It will happen eventually, um, whether it's it's collaborative access, whether it's funding or, or whether it's just the ability of certain nationalities to work in this space in an effective way. Uh, certainly the solution to that from an individual standpoint is to get in early. Um, if you get in before this stuff happens, um, you're in a much better position. Uh, the EU seems to be a lot less... Um, concerned with this at the moment, say, than countries like China or the United States. Hopefully that will continue. What it means for a country like Pakistan as a nation um, is less clear. Uh, certainly if there's uh, no real push within government to sort of fund things domestically, um, whether or not there's a regional collaboration that will happen, um, specifically, you know, India, Pakistan, China, you know, as sort of a regional effort for quantum, um, who knows? That would probably be the most useful thing for Pakistan to do as a nation at this point. Um, but to be honest, I don't know terribly much about what's going on politically um, within Pakistan or, or to how much it cares about uh, developing some kind of domestic capacity in quantum. Uh, second question, are such kind of jobs only for people working in experimental quantum fields or they prefer theorists as well? They prefer everything at the moment, even people who aren't specifically quantum trained. If you have expertise in FPGA technology, there's jobs at quantum companies building qubits. If you have very good ability in software engineering to stand up server front ends, server back ends, networking systems, there's jobs for you at quantum companies. They are hiring across a very, very broad swath of skill sets. Um, if you're a good theorist, um, whether it's an architectural theorist or a, or a Algorithms theorist, there are plenty of jobs. And if you're an experimentalist too, although if you're an experimentalist, you kind of you're you have to fit into the hardware company that does the hardware that you're an expert in. You know, if you're a superconducting person, you're probably not going to get a job at an iron trapping com company very easily. Um, but again, there's companies being founded all over the place. Um, next question: What kind of applications these companies are working on in general? is AI-based work that needs quantum computing. At the moment, it's very speculative if you're talking about applications. At the moment, people are trying to find them. So anyone with a good idea is quite valuable at this point. Um, if it's something that you can identify as having a market or commercial need, because certainly the quantum software companies, they're desperate to find something that they can market um, from a business perspective, rather than sort of saying, well, we don't think near-term quantum computers are going to work for this or work for that. Um, so at the moment, everyone's sort of very much still in the fact-finding stage and trying all kinds of different things to figure out uh, what quantum computers are going to be useful for and on what time scale. Uh, next question, how has COVID affected careers in quantum and things beginning to improve again? COVID definitely has, um, mostly in relation to immigration, um, being able to get from one country to another. Uh, Australia is still uh, in a difficult position. We still have a hard time getting people into the country. Um, but most of the most of the world seems to have opened up now. You know, if you're vaccinated, most countries have pretty open border policies and COVID's not really restricting uh, movement for high tech very much. Uh, can theorists benefit from the increase in the demand for quantum technology? If so, can any fields be specified? I'm not overly sure I understand the question. Um, all of these companies need theorists. Um, even they might not say it out loud because a lot of these companies are run by experimentalists, but they need theorists. 
um, especially if you're, if you're talking about sort of hardcore theorists in quantum system development, they need theorists who understand quantum error correction, that understand the need of quantum algorithms, how our algorithms are going to be implemented. They need device theorists. They need material science theorists. Um, you know, for example, with superconducting technology, error rates in superconducting qubits are related to how good your material science is. Can you fabricate these devices on a wafer with aluminium that don't have defects, that don't have, you know, misplaced atoms or ions through the system? And that's the job of theorists. That's the job of material science theorists. So even if you're very physics-y and do sort of condensed matter, um, first principles calculations, there's a, there's a place for you uh, in this industry, no doubt about it. Um, I hope I did a reasonable good job of, of answering those questions. Thank you very much for that, Simon. Um...